Dan Rolfes, who's the director of the Louisiana Bucket Brigade, uh, myself, a senior policy analyst at the, senior, at the Center for Progressive Reform, and my colleague, Amy Sinden, who is a board member and member scholar with the Center for Progressive Reform, as well as a professor of law at Temple University School of Law. So um, just a little background for those of you who are not already familiar with the Center for Progressive Reform. We're a, a, a policy think tank, a uh, virtual policy think tank in Washington, D.C. that works to educate, collaborate, and advocate. Uh, we're comprised of more than 60 working legal academics spread across the country, folks like uh, Amy here, uh, who work with professional staff like myself to translate their scholarship into actionable um, uh, uh, policy uh, recommendations for, for uh, policymakers. Uh, if you'd like to, uh, in one area that we've been studying for a long time is the regulatory system. So uh, uh, that, that relates to today's topic and it's something that we've been looking at for a long time. And, you, uh, and we invite you to come to our website and uh, learn more about the organization and our, um, and our work in this area. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to, to Anne to talk a little bit about uh, her work with the Louisiana Bucket Brigade. Uh, thank you, James, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here today, and thanks to the Center for Progressive Reform, both for inviting me and for all of y'all's awesome work over a long period of time. And, you know, we can just dig right in if we're talking about uh, both uh, capture, uh, agency capture, as well as the need for uh, enforced health and safety rules. So this quote here, um, Brown is the head of our Department of Environmental Quality. His name is Chuck Carr Brown. He is the director of it. And, he, and this is a quote from a recent article. Brown said, Louisiana's success in managing air pollution can be seen in the removal of all but one of the state's 64 parishes from a national list of counties in non-attainment with federal ozone regulations. And I start with this um, to make the point that on the one hand, you know, the, the head of our Department of Environmental Quality holds up supposed adherence to federal regulations as a testament that he is and his agency is in fact doing a good job. He is, just for a little bit more information, an Exxon retiree. He worked there mm -hmm. for 20 years, and our Democratic governor appointed him as the head of the Department of Environmental Quality. You can imagine how that's worked out. Um, not very well for those of us in Louisiana. And this quote shows you that they are using regulations in a pretty perverse way. They are going around regulations to show that they are meeting regulations. And so in, in response to uh, Mr. Brown's quote, what I would say is, of course you're not going to be measuring any sort of air pollution if you don't have the monitors in place. Um, for background on this, this is a Clean Air Act regulation. It's in regard to um, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. There are certain um, uh, air pollutants that the, that the federal government is supposedly paying attention to very uh, attentively including the federal ozone regulations that Chuck Carr Brown references here. These are supposed to be measured through an air monitoring network in the state. And then if the air monitoring network shows a problem, then, you know, ding, 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 you can't put any new facilities in the area. And so that's what he's referring to here. Again, he is claiming that we are in a robust uh, alignment with those, those regulations, that our air quality is good, what he does not mention is that uh, the, the agency has long removed the, any significant air quality monitoring. Um, so that's just an example, a real life example of how it works, or in this case does not work um, on the ground here in Louisiana. And I want to reference that this quote was provided as a rebuttal to a report that came out by the Environmental Integrity Project just last week showing that the budgets of regulatory agencies around the country have been drastically cut. Um, so it, it was just an interesting example for me how he didn't, that, that Mr. Brown's defense was to really distort reality and in fact claim that regulation was, was working and was being enforced. And that seemed to me to be a very good example to kick off today's uh, webinar. I'm going to just explain a little bit about the pictures you see at, at, um, at right. Um, the EPA conducted an inspection of ExxonMobil. We had been working with neighbors pretty intensely in Baton Rouge, and they succeeded in getting the EPA to do 
an inspection there, and this is what EPA found. These are, uh, this is a photograph from the EPA inspection report. You can see some of the metal is sloughing off from the pipe. In another picture from that inspection, we can see that Exxon, right, one of the world's richest corporations, had, had sealed a valve, I'm not kidding here, with plastic bags and duct tape. That's from the EPA inspection. So this is the situation we're working in. I think shows pretty dramatically the need for, for enforcement of health and safety rules. And then finally, you know, no conversation about Louisiana would be complete without talking about the most impacted people. In this picture, it's Barbara Washington from St. James, Louisiana, who are really leading the fight to get these laws enforced. This picture is taken at a planning commission meeting in which she's making the point that a company, um, in this case it was called Wanwa, had, a, had an explosion in China. Uh, they were preparing to build a facility in St. James, Louisiana, which we did manage to stop through the, the powerful work of people like Barbara Washington. Um, in this case, we were referring to chemical safety regulations, yet another panoply of rules that really need to be enforced. Um, so that's just a window into what's happening here in Louisiana, both from the state agency perspective, I guess you would say really it's more about what's not happening, and then from, from the, the perspective of people most impacted who are really on the front lines doing the work. So thanks you all. I'm looking forward to hearing what James and Amy have to say. Thank you very much, Anne, uh, for that introduction. And, and the reason we wanted to start with Anne is because I think her work in Louisiana, as you just heard, really exemplifies um, the, the central thrust of what we're, we're talking about today, which is that um, the regulatory system has a um, profound influence over, uh, um, over how th this uh, country can go about promoting things like equity and, and social justice. And, you know, things are far from perfect, but there's still some uh, toeholds in there for groups like uh, the Louisiana Bucket Brigade to, to, to advance these, um, these goals. And that through, uh, through progressive reforms um, to the regulatory system, uh, we could accomplish even more. Uh, so a little bit of background here, uh, why we're thinking about this issue. Um, I think as we all recognize, uh, there, some of the biggest challenges we face in this country right now relate to uh, the growing uh, social and economic inequality it explains a lot of um, a lot of the policy challenges we face, um, such as climate change and so forth. So, um, really, to 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 address these policy to these policy challenges, you really do have to get at these issues of social and economic inequality as well. Uh, another sort of background element to, to bear in mind here is that we're seeing this invigorated progressive community right now. Uh, like some of which we haven't seen in a long time in this country. And they're, they're out there with these bold policy responses like the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. And what's important about um, these policy prescriptions is they, they sort of take on the systematic nature of the problems we face. And um, uh, rather than sort of nibbling at the margins, it's really about going to the, to the systems level uh, and addressing them from that, from that scale. And the reason we're uh, so focused on the regulatory system, as I indicated before, is that it is one of the most truly influential systems in our country. Uh, it plays a key role in mediating um, uh, uh, fights between government and, um, and companies, fights between companies, fights between people uh, in their government and companies. So many of these fights are fought in the, the form of the regulatory system. And, uh, uh, and we also um, see that the, the um, regular, and because of that, the regulatory system really is going to play a key role towards achieving a, the progressive vision of society towards which we're all working. Uh, it, it, it plays an institutional determinant of equity and justice, and it's essential to the implementation of the programs that we all care about, whether it's environmental programs, education programs, um, uh, uh, economic security programs, all these sorts of things. So uh, with this in mind, CPR several years ago began 
looking at, uh, began work on what we call our regulations as social justice project. The, the, the thesis of this project is that the regulatory system, a progressive regulatory system, can play, uh, can play a key role in promoting social justice and equality. And it can really do that in, in two ways. One is by helping to implement the programs that's, that ameliorate the, um, the negative consequences consequences of inequality. So things like air pollution or um, uh, uh, inadequate housing and that sort of thing. But it also, because of um, the democratic potential it has through things like public participation, it can also provide a really valuable tool for redistributing political power to ordinary Americans. So uh, earlier this year in June, uh, we um, hosted a convening in Washington, D.C. that brought together more than 60 uh, policy advocates to explore this thesis uh, through their own experiences working within the regulatory system. And we held a series of uh, small group discussions exploring these ideas. And then afterwards, I worked with uh, my colleagues here at CPR and produced a report that sort of synthesized these discussions into what we called a, a crowdsource blueprint for progressive regulatory reform. And that's the report we're discussing today in the webinar. Um, and uh, we, uh, in addition to producing this report, we also uh, created what we call our regs and social justice library that pulls together a lot of materials that we produced and a lot of you and the advocacy community have produced uh, that explores the ideas and recommendations contained in the blueprint in greater detail. So a real quick overview of the crowdsource blueprint. Um, there's really two things going on in this report. One is it provides a, a comprehensive diagnosis of what's of how the regulatory system is, has become broken and how it isn't doing as much as it could to promote social justice and equality. So we explore the four main factors that contribute to the um, broken regulatory system. And, and uh, just to stress this again, these are all uh, ideas uh, and observations that uh, we gathered from folks uh, um, who came to our convening in June. And I think that's what makes this really so powerful is that this is what folks who are working on the ground uh, recognize needs to be fixed. Um, so the first one is weak and outdated laws. I think um, we all recognize that Congress uh, isn't doing the job that it's supposed to when it comes to passing um, uh, new legislation to address uh, the the, the public interest challenges that we all care about. And, you know, I, um, things like climate change, online privacy, all sort of um, exemplify this problem. Uh, the next thing is implementation barriers for, for, for agencies. So even when agencies like EPA or the Consumer Product Safety Commission do have adequate legal uh, authority to tackle these problems, they often have to under, overcome uh, some really difficult implementation challenges to, to put the legal authority into action. And um, a lot of it is, is it precisely intended to, to block implementation. It's, it's, it's often sold as, as being necessary for, for good policy, but it's really just, um, that's really just cover for, for the, the real goal, which is to, to keep agencies from doing things. And so we see this uh, uh, manifest itself in a variety of ways like um, uh, inadequate uh, uh, budgetary resources for agencies, uh, uh, um, procedural barriers that they have to overcome, and um, uh, things like cost-benefit analysis, which my uh, colleague Amy will discuss in a few minutes. And these are, like I said, are all things that prevent agencies from carrying out their statutory missions as effectively as possible. A third uh, factor in, in our broken regulatory system is the excessive corporate influence that uh, uh, that uh, economic elites are able to, to bring to bear. And this affects every element of the regulatory system from Congress to the agencies and, and, and at the federal level and the state level. Uh, so you see this in things like um, uh, the domination of corporate contributions to members of Congress. You see this in, at the agency level with things like um, how age, uh, businesses dominate the public participation process, things like the um, uh, public comment process. Um, so uh, every, ev almost every aspect of the uh, regulatory system, we see um, excessive corporate influence. And as a result, the, uh, the results that the, the regulatory system produces tend to favor uh, corporate interests. And the other side of that coin is there's uh, 
is the fourth factor in the broken regulatory system, which is the barriers to meaningful par public participation. Not only does industry dominate every aspect of the regulatory system, but uh, members of the public who would provide a counterweight to that dominance uh, face uh, incredible barriers to, to having their voices heard in a meaningful way. And so, you know, you see that in Congress with things like um, uh, uh, voter suppression and, and, and um, uh, gerrymandered districts that uh, uh, weaken the power of the votes. You see that in agencies where uh, a lot of um, a lot of the decision making uh, it tends to be very technical and, and therefore inaccessible to to, um, to members of the public. And you see that in the courts where um, a lot of times uh, we have these things uh, we have uh, where, where citizens just don't have the, 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 the adequate access to the courts that they ought to have because of things like standing barriers. And so uh, in response to these factors that, that have contributed to the broken regulatory system, um, the folks who came together at our convening also came up with a lot of ideas about how to rebuild the, the regulatory system in line with the progressive vision of society. And as a result, we were able to put together a really comprehensive agenda for, for how to go about doing that. And the agenda focuses on uh, the four main institutions that contribute to the regulatory system. So Congress, regulatory agencies, courts and state governments. Um, and I think what's really interesting about a lot of these recommendations is some of them are very targeted at the regulatory system. So things like um, improving agency budgets, uh, changing how agencies um, uh, go about their decision making, um, or in the courts, uh, how uh, reducing uh, court interference in, in agency decision making. But some of them are also um, much broader and connected to, to to other progressive goals. So things like campaign finance reform, um, uh, um, and uh, changing how, uh, in, in, increasing uh, opportunities for uh, direct democracy at the state level, uh, which I which we found really interesting. Um, one one. One area that was a, a significant focus for regulatory agencies that um, we found really interesting was the emphasis on uh, increased enforcement. So, um, you know, a lot of the focus, I think, is is uh, on improving agencies' abilities to, to issue new rules and put new policies into place. But a lot of folks also recognize that uh, it was also important to empower agencies to enforce those regulations that are already in the books and to, to do that through us. Uh, strength and enforcement. So you'll see in our report, we have a lot of recommendations for how agencies can go about doing that. So I think that provides a pretty good overview of the report itself. I now will turn it over to my colleague, Amy, who will discuss, um, uh, who will zero in on two important uh, elements of the regulatory system, cost benefit analysis and OIR to, to help sort of illustrate um, the, the, the role that regulatory system has on equity and social justice. Amy, take it away. Thank you, James. Hi, everybody. I can't see you, but I guess hopefully you can see me. Um, so, uh, as James said, I'm going to talk about sort of two of these implementation barriers in a little bit more detail. Um, the first one being cost benefit analysis. Um, and this idea, specifically this idea that cost benefit analysis should be a sort of test for what's a good or legitimate regulation really dates back to the Cold War um, and a set of arch conservative economists, um, most notably Ronald Coase, but there was a whole circle of them hanging out at the University of Virginia, University of Chicago, and the London School of Economics. These were true believers in free markets um, with a sort of deep antipathy and distrust for government. Um, and so this idea of cost-benefit analysis as a test for regulation as conceived by them had sort of from the beginning built into it um, a, a strong bias against government um, and in favor of free markets. And it took the form of essentially putting the burden of proof 
on those who uh, propose regulation or interference of any kind in the free market. The idea being that no regulation should be allowed to happen unless it can pass this cost benefit test, unless it can be shown that the benefits of the regulation outweigh the costs, or in its more formal iteration, unless it can be shown that the regulation maximizes net benefits to society. And those of you who took economics or have some uh, background in economics will recognize that uh, as essentially the, the holy grail of economic efficiency that economic theory says all public policy should be aimed toward um, and also the idea uh, that uh, it, sort of the state of the world that free markets, unfettered perfect free markets are supposed to achieve, right? Uh, maximization of net benefits or uh, uh, maximization of overall social welfare as it's sometimes put. So I think you can see right away that this uh, poses a problem, right? Because, um, you know, regulatory costs come in dollars and cents largely. So if a power plant, for example, is going to uh, install scrubbers on their smokestacks, that's going to cost them a certain amount of money. But regulatory benefits don't, right? Regulatory benefits are things like saving people's lives by preventing them from getting sick, from breathing in pollution, or pulling an endangered species back from the brink of extinction. Those things are really hard to measure, hard to quantify, and even harder to express in dollar terms that can then be compared directly to the dollar costs of regulation. Um, so in the 70s, when Congress passed that whole slew of environmental health and safety regulation that to a large extent is still intact today. That is still where we get our regulatory safeguards today. Um, Congress kind of got that about the, the problems with cost benefit analysis. And, and, and so in almost all instances, Congress rejected cost benefit analysis as the standard by which agencies should issue these kinds of regulations. Congress said instead, uh, that agencies should use uh, something we call feasibility analysis, which is essentially the idea that we should um, presume that pollution and other kinds of environmental degradation and so forth um, are bad and that reducing those things will produce benefits. And we should basically reduce uh, environmental degradation or um, threats to public safety and so on, as much as is feasible, both from a technological standpoint and from an economic standpoint. Um, and you can see that if you use that as your test, it's, uh, it's much simpler and it kind of cuts through a lot of the problems with the cost benefit test. Um, because it doesn't involve trying to quantify in precise terms the benefits of regulation or to, uh, to, to monetize them in dollar and cents terms. So Congress did that um, in most instances. Uh, in some instances, it also simply said, uh, you know, the agency should base the regulation on what's necessary to protect the public health with no uh, consideration of costs at all whatsoever. Um, and so that, that was the state uh, when all of these statutes got passed in the 70s. Um, Subsequently, uh, during the 70s, industry kind of woke up to what was happening, wasn't happy about the uh, regulations that were beginning to come down on them and started pushing back. And this idea of cost benefit analysis was one of the main um, tools that they used to try to push back. They started making arguments um, in various fora and in, in lawsuits that were challenging various agency regulations. They tried to argue, oh, Congress actually meant to use cost benefit analysis. The courts didn't tend to buy those kinds of arguments. But then, of course, in 1981, Reagan comes into the White House um, and gives a friendly ear to industry. Um, and industry is able to convince Reagan to put in place this executive order 
um, that basically enshrines the cost benefit test for all federal regulation. It essentially says that all federal regulations have to pass this cost benefit test. Um, and the executive order also, uh, for the first time, uh, gave real power to this little obscure office in the White House that we affectionately call OIRA, which stands for the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. It's a part of the larger Office of Management and Budget. Um, but this was a small office of a bunch of uh, economists um, and under the new executive order, they became the gatekeepers for all federal regulation and in particular for ensuring that it complied with this cost benefit test. Um, so now agencies had to sort of run this gauntlet at OIRA uh, in this little office in the White House to convince the economists there uh, that their regulations passed this cost benefit test. So that set up this strange situation that um, it still exists today, where, uh, where the agencies are sort of pulled between, on the one hand, they got a statute that says usually, you know, base your regulation on, say, feasibility analysis or on a health-based standard. And then on the other hand, they have this executive order telling them to do a cost-benefit analysis and to base their decision-making on that. Um, if you think back to sort of, you know, grade school civics and schoolhouse rock and all that, we all know that a statute that's passed both houses of Congress and been signed by the president uh, trumps as a, as a legal matter an executive order, which is simply a document signed by the president, right? Um, and so that's the case when in, in situations where the statute tells the agency to use a standard like feasibility analysis or a health-based standard, legally, that's what they're obligated to do. But at the same time, the executive order still forces them to do the cost-benefit analysis. So you get the agencies in this weird situation where they have to complete this complicated cost-benefit analysis that tries to put regulatory costs and benefits in dollar terms and compare them and so on. But then over here they have to say, yeah, but we didn't really consider that in actually making our decision. Um, so that's the first strange thing that ensues from the Reagan executive order. The, the, the second strange thing that happens um, is that this executive order, which originally comes in as just a sort of bald political power play by industry, and everybody views it that way. Um, it just has incredible staying power. Um, and so the executive order is still with us today, having survived through multiple, both Republican and Democratic administrations. The version that still controls today was actually issued by Clinton but Clinton only sort of changed what Reagan had done around the edges, made it slightly kinder and gentler, but it's the same basic idea uh, that regulations have to pass this cost benefit test um, and it's been in place all these decades. Um, and then the third strange outcome of all of this is that over those decades, this idea of a cost benefit test for regulation has really uh, sort of begun to gain acceptance across the political spectrum in a way that I don't think anyone would have anticipated back in 1981 when, as I said, everybody viewed it as just, a, uh, you know, something to, something to help industry try to get out from under the burdens of regulation. Um, but you had uh, in the 90s, as I said, that Clinton decided to stick with this requirement. Um, and subsequently, you had some sort of moderate academics, um, people like Cass Sunstein, um, who seemed to sort of maybe get seduced by this utopian vision of 
hardworking technocrats crunching numbers and bringing scientific objectivity to bear on government decision making and, and, and became big proponents, big cheerleaders for this idea of cost benefit analysis. Even Ricky Rivez, the former dean at NYU Law School, um, has become a champion of cost benefit analysis, wrote a book uh, a little over a decade ago, sort of aimed specifically at the environmental community and kind of saying, look, this can be your friend. Um, we should all kind of join in and get on the cost benefit analysis bandwagon. So the result of all of this is that we've been stuck with this thing now for uh, going on four decades. Um, and in that time, it's done considerable damage in terms of weakening and delaying regulatory safeguards. Um, and to a large degree, the problem is exactly what Congress was worried about in the 1970s. That is to say that on the benefit side of this equation, we just, most of the time, we just don't have the scientific data to be able to translate the benefits of regulatory safeguards into dollar and cents terms. Um, so I did, uh, last year I, I finished an empirical study of EPA rulemakings over a 13 year period, um, which found that in 80% of those rulemakings, EPA was not able to attach a dollar figure to some one or more, usually more, category of benefits that the agency itself uh, uh, described as being either important or significant or substantial, right? And so what this showed is that most of the time uh, the agency is not at all successful in, in fully capturing the benefits of regulation um, in these cost benefit studies. And what happens when they can't quantify something is it just sort of gets left out of the equation. And so you have this problem that benefits get undercounted. Um, this is a particular problem with respect, for example, to um, toxic pollutants. Uh, you know, there's 189 of these toxic pollution pollutants listed specifically by chemical name in the Clean Air Act. Um, and with virtually all of them, uh, EPA is unable to quantify any of the benefits of reducing levels of these pollutants at all, even though these are the, these are the most toxic chemicals out there, the things that, that are linked to causing cancer and endocrine disruption and all sorts of problems. Um, and of particular importance in Louisiana's Cancer Alley and in many other environmental justice communities around the country. Um, so benefits grossly undercounted. And then on the cost side, of course, where does the agency get its estimates of regulatory costs? Well, they get them from industry, of course. And you can imagine that industry often uh, sort of overestimates the costs of, of proposed regulations. Um, so when the agency can't get the numbers to come out right, um, the economists at OIRA, of course, push back and they force the agencies to weaken the rules. Um, and this has happened over and over again over the past number of decades. Also, one of the impacts of OIRA review of regulation is a little more insidious. Um, OIRA review has actually succeeded over the years in literally changing the culture at the agencies. And, and Professor Lisa Heinzerling of Georgetown, who served in Obama's EPA for a number of years, um, talks about this in, in uh, some of her writings about how at the EPA, um, OIRA had had such an impact on the agency that they were afraid to even propose a regulation if they couldn't make the numbers in the cost benefit analysis come out right. Um, 
And of course, uh, the other big problem with regulatory review at OIRA is that OIRA becomes a sort of another pressure point for industry lobbyists. Um, industry lobbyists know that they can go and talk to the uh, officials at OIRA. Um, and they know that they often get a friendlier ear there than they would get at the agencies. Um, the rollback, Obama's rollback of the ozone rule back in 2011 was a sort of classic example of that. Lisa Jackson uh, was trying to ratchet down the national standard for ozone pollution based on what the scientists at the agency had, had recommended. Um, industry did an, an enormous pushback, went to see Jackson, tried to get her to weaken the rule. She stood, stood firm. And so industry went, of course, next to OIRA, where they found a much friendlier reception among the economists there at OIRA, um, and particularly from Cass Sunstein, who had been installed there as uh, President Obama's regulatory czar, as the head of OIRA, um, and who listened to the arguments about how the, the quantified costs of this rule were going to be so outrageous and they were going to outweigh the benefits. And as a result, elevated this, the, the regulation to the White House and ultimately convinced Obama uh, to pull the plug on that regulation uh, just a year before uh, his uh, reelection campaign in 2012. So um, the good news with all of this um, is that the cost benefit requirement is still only an executive order. It has not been enshrined in statute. Um, which of course would do way, way more damage because that would actually change um, on paper the, uh, the decision-making standard that the agencies are supposed to use in every instance. Um, so that hasn't happened. It's not for lack of trying on the part of industry, on the other hand, and the right wing. Um, they, there's been lots of pushes to actually get statutes passed in Congress that would essentially um, uh, put the cost benefit requirement into statute in a way that would be enormously destructive. Those efforts came super close to passing uh, during Newt Gingrich's tenure in the Congress in uh, 1995. They came within one vote of passing. Uh, during the first two years of the Trump administration, when the Republicans were in charge in the House, they passed a whole slew of these so-called regulatory reform bills that included, um, some of them included, putting in this sort of cost benefit super mandate. But, and so that's always, there's always the pressure there to try to do that, but so far uh, that hasn't happened. Um, Another bright spot in all of this, uh, well, is um, the fact that EPA has over the past 10 or 15 years actually uh, been able to beat uh, industry at its own game with respect to cost benefit analysis in a particular class of cases that involve one particular air pollutant and that is particulate matter. I'm going to uh, I, I won't say more about that. If anyone wants to ask about it during the Q&A, we can talk more about it. Um, but EPA, on, with respect to this one pollutant, has been able to generate enormous numbers because there happens to be good health data on that one pollutant. Uh, and these enormous numbers in EPA's cost-benefit analyses have been driving the right wing crazy. It's making, making them absolutely apoplectic. Um, but the bottom line is that all of this is to say um, that there's no question that a new administration in the White House that's serious about social justice will want to, on day one, 
revoke the cost benefit executive order. There's no question about that. The question then becomes, I think, what do you do with OIRA? Do you get rid of it altogether or do you repurpose it? Um, you know, in these debates, the proponents of cost benefit always want to demand from those of us who, uh, who raise questions about it, they say, well, what's your alternative? How are you going to measure, you know, what, what makes a good regulation? And, and my response to that is to say there is no sort of one size fits all tool for evaluating regulation. Generally, the standards that have been put in place by Congress uh, for each particular agency in the statutes that govern that agency are better tailored to the particular kinds of problems uh, that those agencies are, are tackling. And we're best off leaving well alo enough alone with those standards. Um, so it's not at all clear to me that centralized regulatory review in the White House is a good idea at all. On the other hand, um, there's another view that um, I think is worth considering that says maybe we can repurpose OIRA. Um, and maybe uh, from a social justice standpoint, if the biggest problem in the regulatory process is really the, Im the vast imbalance of power between industry and the public, um, maybe what we should do is re-envision regulatory review, centralized regulatory review, as something that addresses that power imbalance head on, that, 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 that tries to create a counterweight um, to the enormous outsized influence of industry in the regulatory game. Um, so why not make OIRA uh, the office that's charged with bringing back balance to the, to the information, uh, right? It's the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Let's bring back balance to the information that the, reg that the agencies get and on which they base their decision making. Right? So why not have uh, a White House office full of community organizers who go out to environmental justice communities and try to hear and amplify the concerns of those communities? Um, and, you know, this wouldn't be a sort of futile attempt at comprehensive um, quantification uh, in the way that cost benefit tries to be. Instead, it would be a kind of qualitative case study, maybe more um, akin to scenario analysis, which is a decision making tool that comes out of the strategic planning literature and that um, has been gaining sort of more and more attention lately. Um, and so maybe we could rethink uh, OIRA in that way as a, as a, as a place for um, sort of going out to EJ communities, uh, listening to those concerns, particularly paying attention to cumulative impacts in those communities, and then bringing those concerns back to the agencies, but in a qualitative, not a quantitative way. Um, I'm going to stop there because I think I've probably run over my time and see if we have any questions. Okay, so uh, thanks, Amy. Um, we have, uh, before we dive into questions, um, uh, just want to point out a few uh, uh, materials for folks who are interested in learning more about the report. You can read the report itself. I also encourage you to uh, visit our regs and social justice library that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and there's also a place there where you can uh, suggest uh, additional materials for that. So um, I'm sure we missed stuff and I, I highly encourage you to, to fill out the online form there and suggest materials to uh, to add to our library, and we'll be happy to do that. Um, and lastly, uh, I know many of you are already doing this. Uh, we learned that at the um, at the uh, uh, convening in June, but I would encourage you all to continue to uh, think about how you can integrate um, progressive regulatory reform into your work. Uh, 
um, you're all, uh, as part of your work, you, um, you recognize the value of the regulatory system to achieving your goals uh, and, and know better than anyone uh, about what works and what doesn't. So um, because you're there on the front lines, uh, you're, you're well positioned to, to, to make the case for regulatory reform as part of your work. So uh, yeah, if uh, anybody has any questions, I uh, invite you to submit them now um, by uh, putting them into the chat box at the uh, bottom of your screen. Um, already we have one from, a, uh, from an audience member. It asks, um, what are a couple of uh, recommendations for improving uh, public participation in the regulatory process and, and what would success in doing that look like? Uh, as you recall earlier, we said that um, uh, there's a huge disparity between the public and, and corporations in, um, in um, how they interact with the regulatory system. And uh, part of that owes to, um, to the barriers that uh, ordinary folks face in, 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 in leveraging those opportunities. So um, uh, in the report, we explore a number of, of things for, 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 uh, for improving uh, the, the public's ability to have a meaningful influence over regulatory policy. So um, uh, that takes a number of forms. One, you know, in Congress, uh, you know, you, you do the, um, the really uh, high level thing and, and in Congress, it could be something like uh, improving voting, uh, uh, strengthening voting rights, um, uh, uh, campaign finance reform uh, to, to, to prevent in, uh, industry from um, from using their dominance to silence uh, the views of ordinary folks. But within the regulatory system itself, um, it could take a, a number of, of um, forms as well. Um, what's interesting is you can sort of break down the regulatory system into three steps, and they all sort of blend themselves to public participation in, in different ways. So the first step would be an actual agenda setting uh, the second step would be policy development, and the third step would be uh, enforcement. And I think those all sort of introduce new opportunities to think about public participation and where the public might be best uh, suited to to um, to, to uh, participate. And I think really at the agenda setting stage and the enforcement stage uh, is where the public participation uh, needs to be strengthened. That came uh, through loud and clear in the recommendations we received. Um, and heard at, at the June convening. And there, uh, folks, for example, on the agenda side, uh, encouraged um, uh, agents or recommended that agencies develop processes for reaching out to, to specific communities and, and take a more place based focus in how they um, develop their uh, policy agendas to find out what um, uh, to, to, to um, affirmatively learn about uh, the communities that their regulations would 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 help uh, and that way they could um, uh, develop uh, more targeted regulatory responses and, and, and decide what the priorities should really be uh, in, in implementing their statutes to the extent that they have uh, discretion over those priorities uh, and then on the flip side the enforcement side uh, was another area because there it's um, When it comes to enforcement, you're really talking about uh, people feeling the effects of, of regulations being followed or not followed, or regulations working or not working. And um, uh, in that sense, um, uh, ordinary people can really bring their sort of lived experience to bear on enforcement. And they're well positioned to, to, to let agencies know uh, when, it, when a particular company, for example, isn't following a regulation. And so, in, in to really take advantage of that, we need to empower uh, people to, to uh, participate in enforcement more. Uh, and, uh, you know, fortunately, stat some environmental statutes already have that through citizen suits, but um, those could be expanded to other, uh, to other um, contexts as well. And, uh, and to, to give them even more teeth to reduce uh, barriers to standing so that um, ordinary people have greater access to the courts. We have a couple more questions here. I'll just say, James, I guess I'm yeah. my unmuted. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, and I would say in addition to like various procedural ideas for trying to both get information out to the public generally and to solicit feedback from the, from the public, it's also important to recognize that um, the decision-making standard that the agency is using has enormous implications for public participation and for who is able to participate to what degree, right? Um, because the decision-making standard essentially uh, determines what's the information base on which the agency should be making its decision. Um, and if that decision-making standard is, for example, cost-benefit analysis, then what that means is that the information base that the agency is supposed to be relying on is by definition this incredibly uh, complex technical uh, uh, you know set of jargon full of mathematics and and completely unattainable to the average and uh, in, in, incomprehensible to the average person um, so 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 part of thinking about this is really thinking about what's the kind of information that we want the agencies to be considering and what's the kind of information and, and in what package will information from disempowered groups come to the agency in and, and, and how can we incorporate that kind of information into agency decision making. Certainly when everything has to be quantified and expressed in mathematical formulas that um, uh, creates a, a decided bias um, in favor of industry, in favor of those who have the resources and the wherewithal to, to hire their own economists to sort of fight back against the government economists and puts certainly uh, EJ communities at a distinct disadvantage. Great, thank you. So uh, another question we have here is, um, what do we think would be needed to integrate the role of quali qualitative research and community organizers into OIRA? Uh, is anybody else working on this? Uh, I think part of that would have to go to um, rebuilding OIRA from the ground up, uh, which Amy was talking about. Amy, do you have uh, some thoughts about what that might look like? Um, yeah, I mean, I and, and Part of the problem is, and one of the reasons that I started with maybe the best solution is to eliminate OIR altogether, is that, you know, this is a this is an office that's been in place for going on half a century, um, and it has a very uh, well embedded uh, institutional culture. Um, and that is that it ha is and always has been made up of a group of economists that have a, a very particular way of looking at the world. Um, and you know, maybe you can go in and and fire all the economists and hire a bunch of community organizers, um, or maybe you just get rid of that office altogether and start again from scratch. Um, and you know, I I think there needs to be more thinking um, about exactly what that looks like. But I do think that sensitivity to sort of institutional culture and the set of assumptions that kind of go along with that is a really important piece of that puzzle. So um, maybe a different way of thinking about that is um, uh, designing policy so that it empowers uh, community organize, organizers to, uh, uh, to, to participate in its implementation. And I know there's um, uh, some literature out there uh, exploring that particular idea. Um, uh, uh, professor, uh, or the president of Demos, uh, Subil Rahman, has talked about this. Evidently, during the 1960s with the uh, war on poverty um, and, and some of those community development programs, there was a lot of emphasis on designing policy to, to empower community organizers. And uh, evidently, the, the, the history, uh, the historical record of this uh, reports that it was that they were wildly successful so successful in fact that industry um uh made it a priority to gut it and succeeded in doing so um 
So I, so there might be a two-step process. One is to fundamentally rewrite how statutes are designed to, to, um, to, be, to build policy implementation around that. And uh, maybe that could be the role of OIRA, in, in effect, is to, um, uh, to, to supervise um, to, super, to, to supervise those programs and figure out how they work and how they could be made better uh, and that sort of thing. And in 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 that sense, it would be um, kind of like a, a um, uh, it, it would be sort of like a community engagement um, uh, focal point within the White House, which you know I think could be really valuable uh, both as a policy matter and also um, from a for lack of a better word, uh, from a rhetor rhetorical term, um, standpoint, because what you're really doing is you're putting the emphasis where it belongs, which is what is the on the ground uh, community level impact that these policies are having. Uh, and you can see how that makes a huge difference compared to what we have now, which is uh, economics, the cost benefit analysis um, uh, 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 doctrine that sort of holds sway in regulatory decision making. So we have another question here, um, and it uh, recommends looking at uh, collaboration among agencies um, as, as a way of uh, building, rebuilding a, a progressive regulatory system uh, so that it promotes social justice. Are there examples of that sort of thing going on now? Um, I'm sure there are, are, are great examples out there. Um, one I think that I'm aware of, uh, we heard from a, f a former EPA um, uh, person during uh, the, the Obama administration who talked about, uh, I think it was a community in Alabama or Tennessee, and how um, they went down there to look at uh, maybe a Superfund site or something like that. Uh, and they also noticed that there was um, these sort of deplorable housing conditions, public housing conditions. So they brought in um, the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development and uh, took a more comprehensive view of um, of you know, what those communities' challenges are. You know, it was completely voluntary. There was no statutory basis for it. There's nothing, you know, illegal about it. It certainly wasn't in excess of their authority, but there was nothing that would sort of compel them to do that. It was just sort of um, something that they recognized as a good idea. So uh, these sorts of things, they're out there, um, but, you know, wouldn't it be great if there was uh, not just statutory authority um, that, or if there was, wouldn't it be great if there was statutory authority that that sort of systematized that and and made that the um, the, the norm and not the exception? So that, so that's one example. Amy, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, I was just going to say, you know, one of the one of the problems with this, you know, this economics based sort of cost benefit approach is that it pretends to be considering all the relevant information, you know. <laughs> This is why my students are always, at least at first blush, so taken with it, right? So intuitively, it feels like, how can you argue with, you're going to consider the costs, you're going to consider the benefits. It has this veneer of comprehensive rationality, um, but that veneer is really false because the reality is that when you analyze things in that way, you inevitably leave a lot of really important things out. And one of the things you leave out is, for example, the cumulative impacts as they affect individual members of, for example, EJ communities, right, who are dealing not just with the toxic exposure from, you know, the big uh, plant that's in belching, you know, hazardous air pollutants at them, but also with lead in their drinking water and a gazillion other things that are all dealt with by a patchwork of different um, statutes and different agencies and so on. And so, you know, I, I, I really think the questioner is coming from a good place in terms of saying, if we're going to have some kind of centralized review, let's, let's use it to try to coordinate what all these different agencies are doing to look specifically at cumulative impacts on individual people. And when you switch from this approach, the sort of what I would call the fake comprehensive rationality approach that cost benefit pretends to take to, to a qualitative approach like scenario analysis that doesn't 
pretend to sort of, you know, aggregate all impacts to every person in society, but says instead, let's focus in on some particularly disadvantaged people in particular EJ communities, then it allows you to develop a much more granular and detailed picture of an individual person, let's say, and all of the ways in which their health and safety and well-being is being impacted by various um, government policies, uh, you know, in their particular locality. When you do that, you're actually you know, in some ways it seems like you're narrowing the lens, but in another way, you're really expanding the lens to see a whole different perspective on the problem that really emphasizes um, the most disadvantaged people in society and that emphasizes cumulative impacts. I think that's really important. Great, thanks, Amy. Uh, we have another question here. It asks for any good analogies or interesting ways to illustrate the importance of the regulatory system and how it works for us or doesn't. Um, you know, when I uh, talk or sort of give my elevator speech for, you know, what I do for a living, talking about the regulatory system, um, one thing that I point out or, or try to point out is um, how easy it is to take advantage of the regulatory or to, to, to take um, the regulatory system for granted. Um, it's sort of, it's around you all the time. Uh, and the reason you don't notice it is because it's working. Uh, and that, that's what makes um, defending the regulatory system so innately challenging because you're essentially um, uh, defending something that you don't want people to notice because that means it's working. Um, and, and, and so, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you pull food off the, off the, the shelf, you don't have to worry about it being safe. When you, um, when you, fill up your glass from the water tap. You don't have to worry about it containing contaminants. Um, when you uh, drive your car someplace, you don't have to worry about, um, or you, you, you ordinarily don't worry about it just falling apart or, or if you get in a wreck, something really bad happening. You just, you're able to go about your life in this way uh, that you might not otherwise be able to because you sort of take for granted that all these things are gonna work for you. And that's, that, that's not businesses, that's not the invisible hand, that's not businesses doing things out of the goodness of their heart, that is the regulatory system at work. So um, if, if you have any soccer fans out there or, or, or baseball fans, here, take this. Um, they always talk about the good umpires are the ones you don't notice. You know, they don't make bad calls, they just make the, the calls that people don't really notice. And I think that's sort of like the regulatory system is, um, um, it, it works best when you don't notice it. And, and, and that's, that's sort of the challenge that, that we face in, in, um, in, in, in highlighting its importance to, to society. Amy? Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, that's such a great question and it's a tough one. Um, and of course there's the periodic things that make it into the news that you can use as examples, the Flint crisis, the lead in drinking water, or the recent explosion of the chemical plant in Texas, you know, that happened just as the Trump administration was rolling back the rules that would have required that plant to put in place safety precautions to prevent that kind of thing. Um, and so you can always, you know, highlight sort of the latest of those that's been in the news. But the problem, of course, with that, and this is, I think, what James is getting at, is that it that's of course emphasizing uh, the government failures, right? I mean, you know, Flint, for example, was just a massive failure at all levels of government to the point where, you know, some of the state and local people actually were charged criminally. Um, and, and, and I get concerned about only emphasizing those failure stories um, in part because, you know, it seems to me in the era of Trump, one of our biggest enemies is cynicism cynicism more generally, but particularly cynicism about the government. And of course, you know, uh, the right wing has been pushing that story about government and how it's, you know, hopelessly corrupt and so on and so forth for decades. And they've made quite a bit of headway. And of course, Trump is just putting the cherry on top by, you know, demonstrating every day <laughs> sort of incompetence, corruption, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, I, and, it, and I worry a lot about how that's, 
um, affecting, you know, uh, our allies on the left, young people on the left, um, who become disenchanted and start to believe that government can never do anything right. So um, I've uh, started trying more and more to emphasize to my students the regulatory success stories that we do have. And I often tell them a story about um, when I, I, I taught at our program over in China, well, this is about 10 years ago now, and then um, the same students I had taught got to come over here to Philadelphia as part of, part of our program to spend a couple of months here in Philadelphia studying international law. And um, so, you know, for most of them, this was their first time coming to the United States. Um, and so I would often ask them, what's the thing about the United States or Philadelphia that you found most surprising when you got here? And many of them said to me, the blue sky, right? Which, <laughs> you know, is sort of a funny thing to say about Philadelphia. I don't think of us as the sort of bluest sky place in the world. But compared to Beijing, uh, the sky is really blue here. Um, and that, you know, as I say to my students, that's a testament to the, the enormous success of the Clean Air Act. Um, so, so that's just to say, I mean, I, and, but of course that runs into the problem that James was, was addressing about, you know, when it works, you, you're not paying attention to it. But um, I do think it's important to try to emphasize government success stories um, as much as we can. Okay, uh, we are running way, way over, and I want to be uh, sensitive to people's times. Um, we have several questions left, but I get, I, let's try to push through one more. Um, so we have a question here, and it asks about uh, somebody who is working with EPA on uh, the lead and copper rule. This is uh, a rule to prevent um, uh, contaminants from getting into our drinking water supply. And this person points out that um, when they try to uh, uh, involve uh, members of the public of, of affected communities in, in the decision making process, uh, they were dismissed by agency folks because uh, they were concerned that these uh, ordinary members of the public would only bring opinions and not facts. And this reflects a problem in culture at, at agencies and how do we change that culture. Um, you know, I, it sounds like cost-benefit analysis at the root of this problem. Amy, did, did you want to? <laughs> well, I just really loved that question, and I really appreciate um, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the story that you're telling, um, because I just think it points um, to a lot of what we're talking about, about the way in which the decision-making standard defines the information that is considered important and relevant and, and how many sort of destructive assumptions are embedded in that um, choice of standard. So I do think that, you know, really thinking through um, alternative decision-making standards for agencies in terms of the kinds of information that those standards make relevant. Um, and in particular, uh, the kinds of people who have access to the kinds of information that those standards make relevant is a really important way of, of getting at this um, fundamental problem of the vast you know, disparity in power between industry um, and you know the people who are most harmed by uh, these environmental um, and other kinds of um, problems. Um, so I, I just I just mostly I just thought it was a great question for highlighting that particular issue that I feel like we need to really focus on as we think about redesigning the regulatory system. So, yeah, and. And I think it relates back to uh, something I brought up earlier when we were talking about um, reforming um, pu the public participation at different stages of the rulemaking process. I mean, to a certain extent, you feel a little, um, you, you sort of understand to a certain extent where the agency decision makers are coming from because they're um, implementing these statutes, and in this case, the Clean Water Act, uh, which are these technology-based standards. They're inherently very technical questions they're trying to resolve. So, um, uh, so you, you you sort of sympathize with their their interest on 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 
wanting to, to, to know the facts. Um, and that's why I think what we were finding at our, uh, um, our convening in June was that people were finding more opportunities for involving uh, ordinary folks, not less in the decision-making process because it does end up being this inherently technical process. Uh, and that sort of relates to the statute, to the statutes being implemented, but that, um, you know, the, 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 the unique experiences, the real um, expertise that ordinary people are able to bring to the rulemaking process is better applied um, at the, the agenda setting stage and at the enforcement stage. Um, so uh, so what, I guess another way of tackling that is to really uh, find more ways to, to, to funnel um, the public in, into those sorts of, uh, into those um, components of, of the regulatory um, process. And, um, you know, there are certainly ways to involve uh, the public in, in decision making, certainly, um, uh, particularly as a way to serve as a counterweight to whatever industry is going to be telling them. But I think, uh, by and large, uh, what we're finding or what people sort of recognize is that the real opportunities for involving the public uh, exist and uh, agenda setting and enforcement. Uh, I wish we had more questions or more time to get to these questions that we could get to, but uh, I, we've run way over time. Um, and so I thank you all for joining us today, uh, particularly with all the other important things going on this morning. So we, we appreciate your attention to this. Um, uh, and I just wanted to pipe in and make a special thanks to Ann Rolfs for joining us at the beginning of the webinar. And just to say, unfortunately, she had another obligation and had to cut out. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we really appreciated her contribution today. Yep. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, at, soon you'll be getting an email from us with a survey uh, on the webinar itself and uh, links to additional materials related to the um, webinar as well as a recording of the webinar if you want to revisit it. Um, thank you all again for joining us.